as we head south and east. The scenery doesn't change a whole lot till finally Steens Mountains tower. We see the snow caps staring high in the background. We're almost to where Annette has bought 160 acres out in the Oregon desert. We'll go down the paved highway for a ways, then we'll turn off on a dirt and gravel road. The Steens Mountains are the most impressive snow-capped mountains in this part of southeast Oregon. We travel down the paved highway a ways, then we see the sign that says White Horse Ranch Road. We'll take a right on to White Horse Ranch Road, which is a graveled road, and we'll go down it a ways till we come to White Horse Hot Springs, where we'll camp for the night. The road comes to a point straight in front of us on White Horse Ranch Road. White Horse Ranch is a giant ranch out in the southeast corner of the Oregon Desert and they run their cattle over many many acres. They feed very little hay in the winter. Their cattle in the winter run on this lower part of the desert where they eat the dry grass and move around. They have to constantly keep the cattle on the move because it takes 40 acres of this dry desert land for one cow. We reach a high point. Here we can look out and see the big Coyote Lake dry out beyond us and a smaller pothole which is another dry lake bed playa. Kent and Roxy are enjoying the scenery of the Steens Mountains and the desert beyond us. We move on down the road toward White Horse Hot Springs and a cloud of dust is billowing up behind us. Past the ranch house and buildings of White Horse Ranch as we're going west just a few more miles till we come to White Horse Hot Springs. The White Horse Ranch's only industry is cattle as we move past the buildings and then on. And of course, if it's cattle, they have to be at least one of them out in the road. Kind of a bad little calf getting out in the road. But he realizes his mistake and moves on over to Mama as the Steens Mountains stand tall in the background. In recent years, the White House Horse Ranch wasn't making it only with cattle, so they decided to try the tourist thing and have a few dudes come to the ranch to visit. They've even put up a few teepees strictly for the dudes to sleep in. We turn off the White Horse Ranch Road onto a smaller road which leads us for about three or four miles down to White Horse Hot Springs. There's a place where we'll camp there and that hot springs is pretty nice to use as well. We'll pull in to the White Horse Hot Springs and set up our camp. We brought our canoe along just in case we want to use it at Crumble Reservoir, or maybe even at Chickahominy, past the hot springs, and into a little camping area, tucked off, tucked back, all by itself in the corner. And the hot springs is just a perfect temperature, and there's a hotter pool and a cooler pool, which will make good use of both of them. Since it looks like it's going to be really nice weather, it looks like the hot springs will be really nice place to be. And here comes Kent and Roxy right behind us. They'll be spending the night here as well.
The Bureau of Land Management has even set up a toilet in the campground. So everything we need is here. There are even picnic tables. We choose camping down as far as we can drive on this little road and that way we have lots of wildlife, lots of birds and beavers and a beaver pond in Willow Creek right by us and even some beavers. We can hear the birds squawking and singing as we back into our camping area. And here comes Kent and Roxy into camp next to us. We had a real nice night in the campground, even got to use the hot springs, so, and we could hear the birds all night long, coots and other kinds of waterfowl and beaver were out there making racket. And so the next morning, we're up bright and early, and we're heading out to see if we can find some sunstones. We go out to the White Horse Ranch and a ways farther. This is the Denio Sunstone area, and it's about 50 miles from Denio. But we're going to make the trip out and see if we can find some sunstones up a true track dirt road with sagebrush and grass in the center of it. We'll go up till we find a good spot to look for the sunstones. They're known as the Oregon Diamond and supposedly Oregon is the only place in the country where you can find them. I have heard there's one state on in the eastern part of the United States where you can find some, but I don't know for sure. But we get there, the sun is just coming up nice and bright, and we're finding sunstones all over the place. We're planning to get a batch more of them and send them over to an island in the Indian Ocean and have them faceted into some real nice jewelry. So we're looking for some nice colored ones and the bigger they are, the better. Let's see your bag, Kent, how it's looking. Yeah, it's looking good. <laughs> yeah, nice. Nice. I don't know did, did you find some? How did I get that in there? You find oh. some you're pretty happy with? Eh, yeah, I guess see there it's got a oh, yeah, it's got some little in bit it. in it. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. These sunstones are on the high desert overlooking a sea of sagebrush. And you just look around on the ground and there they are. You're just laying right on the surface. The winter snows melting and rains and wind I've always uncover a bunch the first thing in the spring so we're finding them pretty good now looks like Marge has her share too one of the symbols of the desert the black-tailed jackrabbit takes to hoof and hops off through the sagebrush and then hides relying on his camouflage to keep to keep himself hidden it takes a sharp eye to see this little guy crouch behind a sagebrush. After we found all the sunstones that we could possibly want, we decide to go out and take a look at Annette's property out near the dry lake bed called Coyote Lake. We go down a two-track road that's rutted a little bit kind of bad at first, and then gets better. We get out to where we think the property is and Kent's got his GPS. We're going to take some readings and just make sure we're in the right place. After trying the GPS, it's now time for us to go down and check out Coyote Lake. The playa of Coyote Lake shines like a jewel and then we're finding some little rocks down on the des 
desert and also a little horn toad that we're looking at right down on the edge of the playa in Coyote Lake. By now we've spent most of the day and the shadows are growing long and then we spot it, a rock that makes a trail, a moving rock. The wind blows these rocks across the playa when it's wet and they make a trail and some t this trail we followed it for several hundred yards and finally it ends up right at the rock. These rocks are a f phenomena that can occur on any playa. They're more well known for the racetrack playa down in Death Valley National Park but we find them on the Albert Desert and also this huge one on Coyote Lake. We figure it weighs several hundred pounds. The playa is really nice to drive on. It's almost as smooth as Safeway's parking lot. And you can really get up your speed out on the playa. And particularly it's really awesome at the last light of day as we make a circle around, come back by the moving rock, and then we'll head back to camp shortly. Most of these playas were deep lakes full of water about the end of the ice age, but then they have no drainage, and so all the minerals from the surrounding hills washed in here and they're deposited, making a dry lake bed out of it. But most all playas have a little water setting on them sometime during the year, or else they would come up with some brush, although this is more alkalis, boraxes, and limes that create the playa, along with some clay. So it's really hard and a cracked surface that hums when you drive over it. Since we're out here, we're going to drive around and do a little exploring. At one time, they used these for military practice. They used them for a bombing range and also they used them to shoot their 50 caliber machine guns. So there are still some empty brass from the 50 caliber and some fins from bombs laying around on the playa. If you could only find them, I, th I expect most of them have become buried by now, being such a long time ago. The sun is starting to go down behind the Steens Mountains as we move back toward the hot springs to spend the night. Kind of a spectacular sunset with the Steens Mountains standing tall in the background and a few little dry rain squalls showing up. And it looks like today's our day to see some wild horses. These wild horses are spread out across a vast area of the desert and they've got hundreds of square miles to roam and so they might be in another place and you might not get to see them every day but it looks like we're lucking out and we get to see some really nice ones today. They don't look like they wintered too well this last winter. They're in a little bit of poor physical condition but there is a nice cold and another mare or two that looks like she's with foal too. And of course the big majestic stallion that always challenges you and stays between you and his mares. They play a little game with you running back and forth and then they'll come back by again just to take another look and let you see them. I can see a few ribs showing on these horses, but as soon as that green grass comes on, 
and they get something better to eat, they'll fatten up real nice. There's some very pretty colored ones, palminos, and all sorts of other colors in this herd. They're definitely wild and free and have never felt a cowboy a straddle them or have never had a rope or a halter or a bridle or a saddle on them. They just run free and do as they want. One thing about these horses out on the desert, their hooves become very hard and any horse that doesn't have extremely hard feet just plain won't make it running through the rocks and out across the desert. The little colt thinks he's got good hard feet. He's running around a lot as well as his mother and father and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and cousins. The old stallion has fought many a battle to keep his harem and this must be a good stallion he's got a nice big harem kent uses this for a photo op to get some pictures of these majestic beasts out in their natural habitat good thing these aren't the old film cameras or we'd have probably been out of film a long time ago and there they are. They're coming back by us one more time. As soon as they get done playing with us and showing off for us, they'll make a cloud of dust and head out through the desert to infinity. They come over to this area about every day when they're in the area because that's where their source of water is and their feeding ground is on off over these desert hills but they can travel 20 miles from their feeding ground to where they water in one day it doesn't take them long either these horses have definitely well adapted to the desert where they live after the wild horses we go take a look at some of the old stone homestead houses that were built out here in the 1800s. The ruins are still standing tall. They're very well built with complete with a fireplace, even a rat's nest in the fireplace. There must have been a sawmill around someplace. We see a little bit of sawed lumber sticking in the rock work this must have been the hearth to set things on when you're cooking to keep it warm the board with the nail holes in it must have been they had nails in there to hang their pans and kettles on and then we can see how these rocks were chipped out by hand and shaped and made into just a really nice comfortable cabin juniper logs were laid on top of it and then willows over them and dirt on the roof to make a really nice warm roof. Meanwhile back at camp Sam has showed up. Sam and I work together as park rangers and we're taking Sam's GPS out again to see what we can find out about Annette's property. Sam adjusts the GPS and puts the coordinates in and we think we might have found it. It's got to be right here in this area but he only has the type of GPS that are for highways so it really doesn't tell us exactly how to go but the Steens Mountains are standing tall in the background and we think we know where the property is. We're not absolutely certain yet so we'll go out and see if we can find the northern boundary of it and then go over and check Coyote Lake out. We cross the playa of Coyote Lake and go out to a fence. Sam must not be a real cowboy either. He hasn't learned to ride in the middle where real cowboys would ride so you don't have to mess with the gate. 
and then we find the spot on the map and we're going out and check out one of the BLM wells it's called the Coyote Lake well out beyond us yeah I think it's an all-weather road up here and through here yeah but now there's got to be a mistake uh, you could come through See, here's the Bone Canyon Road, which if you follow it all the way through, comes out here just south of Burns Junction, what, about five miles. Yeah. So you come in from either way. Yeah. Well, it's going to be a little deeper for diving. Yeah. Yeah. It's even got a critter ramp if a critter gets in there so he can swim around and get out. That's that's good that the conservationists are uh, alive and well. Yeah, they yeah. don't really don't want dead critters in your uh, in your water. Yeah, in your water. So yeah. there's a water hole over there. Yeah, when we were here before, they had the pump running because the cattle were in here, and that pond was full too. That's the bathtub, Sam. Oh, that's possibility. Unless they uh, just run that thing when the, there's enough juice. Yeah. <laughs> From the well, we head back across Coyote Lake, and we're going to head back over to where we're camped at the hot springs. Takes us only a short while to cross the few miles a coyote lake. The only thing we have to watch for now is a place to get off the playa. Coyote Lake is quite a large dry lake bed. At one time this held water, but over the centuries it's filled in to where it's nothing but clay, boraxes, and alkali. We see one of the famous moving rocks and this is a big one. At first these moving rocks were thought to have been the magnetic pull of the earth was one theory and other theories have came along but finally they settled on the fact that the wind blows them and sometimes with the aid of ice. We're following the trail this moving rock has made and it has literally moved miles, and this rock weighs hundreds of pounds. But the wind really hoops it up out here, and you can see where it turns as it slides across the playa. One day the wind blows one direction, the next day another direction. So it's turned, and we're moving up toward the rock, following it's moving trail. It's doubtful these rocks move when the playa's dry. It has to be wet and probably ice would help a lot, although maybe not in all cases. Sam will set on this big four or five hundred pound boulder. It is really one of the larger ones that we've ever have seen moved. An old buzzard setting up on the berm at the end of Coyote Lake checking us out as we go by. Then he takes to wing and gracefully soars over the playa of Coyote Lake in very graceful flight. There. Yeah, we found this fence and we think that might be Annette's boundary along this old ruins of a fence. Even some extra barbed wire right on the corner. It could the view of the Steens Mountains 
is awe-inspiring every time you glance up. And twin buttes are right nearby, the little flat-top buttes standing tall on the floor of the desert. This is a whole new experience for Annette, owning desert property in the rain shadow of the Steens Mountains, and I think it's going to be a really, really enjoyable time being out here and possibly building a cabin. Twin Buttes are sitting here with their little sawed-off tops missing, and then the rest of it is just a flat with some prairie grasses growing on it. Sam and I have almost given up on finding the property boundaries, so we're going to head back to where we're camped at the hot springs under partially cloudy skies with a wind blowing. And, of course, an old antelope buck looks on as we go by. These are the world's fastest long-distance runners, but this old guy's not even bragging. He's just sitting there watching us go by with a good deal of curiosity. After he gets tired of us, he trots off a little ways, and then he thinks maybe it would be nice to take one more quick look and see if he could figure out just exactly what we're up to. And then he does what antelope... Marge is taking it easy back at camp while Sam and I are working around doing a few chores around the camp. Every year while we're here at this time of year, some of the northern harrier hawks are always nesting nearby. They nest right on the ground and raise a few chicks. Then they bring food over to feed their babies. And the babies are sometimes even flying. And they'll come up and then the adult will drop the mouse or frog or whatever it is for them and the babies will catch it in mid-flight. An old crow, common crow, circles over and then I see it, a crow nest right in the tree down below us. And there's quite a bit of activity going on. I couldn't really see whether it was baby crows or maybe just some eggs. Whatever it is, the crows are taking good care of it. Along about evening, it's time to go up on the hill and look at the beaver ponds. Stretching out along tiny Willow Creek in front of us. Willow Creek winds its way through the sagebrush covered desert and Beavers take good advantage of it. There are numerous beaver ponds, and this crow has found him a place to nest right on the edge of a beaver pond. There's a perch where one of the crows sat most of the time, and by now the sun is setting low in the sky, getting ready to dip down below the horizon. Out of the corner of my eye, I catch some activity down in the beaver pond. And it's not a duck or a coot. It's one of the designers and architects of the dam. It's a beaver gl gliding through and checking out his handiwork. He'll cut willows and bury them in the mud. That's kind of like a refrigerator. And then when winter comes, he knows just exactly where to go get his feed. That way he doesn't have to get out in the cold and snow. His big broad tail works good as a signaling device and also a rudder. And we watch him as the sun majestically dips down 
below the horizon of the Steens Mountains. A little beetle makes his way across a little bit of gravel as the sun steadily sinks below the horizon. Our camp is right down below a hill and I always like to walk up on this hill at sunset and look down upon our camp right down below us and Sam's with me today so we'll take a look and a few pictures while we're up here and watch for more beaver. The hot springs is down below us and now it is time we're going to head down to McDermott, Nevada. We heard about some petrified wood down there so we're going to go see if that's a myth or if it really exists. As we head out the dirt road beyond the hot springs and out of camp and then out onto the main road heading east. We stop for a moment to look at a Great Basin gopher snake laying on the road. The Steens Mountains are still towering above us as we head out onto White Horse Ranch Road and from White Horse Ranch Road we will hit the paved highway down to McDermott, Nevada. McDermott's 34 miles down this paved road and Winnemucca is 105 miles south of us down Highway 95. The highway's quite, quite straight ahead of us and so Marge is going to catch up on her knitting. It's just more desert scenery. When we reach McDermott our gas tank needle is dipping toward the empty mark so it's time for us to take on a little gas that is if we can figure out how to run this pump. Finally it decides to start pumping us some gas so we'll gas up and then head for the petrified wood place. We have a book that gives some directions to get to the petrified wood place but they're not very specific and we can't find the petrified wood but we're finding all sorts of other rocks and here's an old grader left by the mercury miners. This old grader, it's been a while since it's been used but it still looks like it could probably be fixed up although the motor's missing and a few things in it. So we're going to take a look around the mine and then come back and look, look at the old grader. There are all sorts of signs here say do not go in this area stay out and live I guess because of the threat of mercury poisoning. Back to the old grader it looks like the desert environment has taken a toll on it over the many many years that it sat here idle but we'll try it out and see if it'll start up. I thought I was going to run over Marge with it as I came down the hill but she got out of the way. The brakes weren't too good on it. Then we go to the spot where there is sort of a junkyard. 
There's all sorts of old things down below. And we see some of the furnaces where they'd shovel the cinnabar ore in and fire and the mercury would evaporate out and the tanks that are standing up behind where, where they captured the mercury and then bottled it and it was ready for the market. Probably this was used extensively during World War II. Mercury had a lot of uses during the war time from everything from switches on. Quite an interesting old mine site. And then it's time for a break. Looks like Marge has already got into the soda pop and we're stopped down along a little stream and we're still looking for that elusive petrified wood and it looks like we didn't find the wood but we found one of the great basin gopher snakes crawling out to warm himself up on this nice sunny day. These snakes are non-venomous constrictors so they'll capture something They'll get a mouse or whatever they want to eat and catch him with their little holding teeth. Then they'll suddenly just wrap themselves around it, squeezing all of the very life out of their prey. And they'll squeeze it till it's a good shape where they can swallow it quite easily. And these snakes are usually about the first out of hibernation and the rattlesnakes come next. This guy must have just came out of hibernation and he seems to have lost his sense of humor. He doesn't see anything cute about us. He just as soon strike us. And they can strike you and when they strike you they can lose some of those little holding teeth in your skin. And then you have to take a pair of tweezers and pull them out or else they could cause infection. One thing he does well, he's a great intimidator and he can hiss where it sounds like you've just ran a big spike through a tire and the air is escaping. He's on his way out to the hunting ground to find him a nice mouse or something to eat so he can get started on a summer of hunting in the prairie grass meadows of the high desert. He has not much patience with us. Steens Mountains. Then we go back to the hot springs and the water is hot and we can see the volcanic gases escaping and working bubbling their way to the surface as a little steam curls skyward. I hadn't been down to see if the raven's nest has been built this year. I go past an old chimney which is was built by the homesteaders. As near as we can tell, there's been an old sod house here, or sodies they called them. And all the sod has melted away, leaving only the chimney left standing tall here right alongside Willow Creek. And what a location for a home. Willow Creek is right in their back door and then there are cliffs right across from it with swallow nests and even a raven's nest in the cliffs. The, this is the cliff swallows. They build a little nest with a little door in it. And then the raven's nest is standing tall up on the cliff above us. These ravens seem to nest in colonies. There are two raven's nests here. One of them in a little hole in the rock. And they nest in the same spot every year just overhauling the nest. And they're one of the birds that can get along with each other. The next morning it's time for us to go. We're going over on the other side of the Steens Mountains and see if we can catch a fish in Crumble Reservoir. An old antelope stands by 
and watches us move down the road. And then does what antelope always do, take to hoof and disappear out through the sagebrush. We move over through the Catlow Valley and on up to, to French Glen, and from there we're going down and camp at Page Springs Campground, right off Highway 205, about four miles. This is the Roaring Springs Ranch, and it's cattle country. We see hundreds of head of cattle out in the fields, just waiting for the green grass to come on so they can drive them high up into the Steens Mountains for the summer. Past the buildings at the Roaring Springs Ranch, which looks like a small town, and then on north. This is another huge desert ranch, which is even on the Oregon Highway maps, as is Whitehorse Ranch. And there's some cliffs surrounding the Roaring Springs Ranch, where some springs just come roaring right out of the side of the mountain and of course this was used by the earliest of man that ever set foot on North America these were some of the Indian caves and they had everything they need there a great spot to hunt and plenty of water these caves were inhabited as the Great Basin, the water Great Basin receded and left these caves. At first the inhabitants were fishermen and duck hunters, but then later they became big game hunters like woolly mammoth and camel hunters. There are several caves there that were inhabited for centuries. As we move on toward Crumble Reservoir, then we look in a little patch of trees, and here's an old doll looking in a little bit of rough shape because she's just losing her winter coat, getting her summer coat. But she thinks she's awful pretty, and she's sneaking through the bushes real carefully. Then we look and see several more deer sneaking away from and these are the mule deer out in this area. The springs are huge and they just come roaring out of the side of the mountain and the banks of them are covered with watercress and monkey flowers. There's one of the very best examples that I can think of of the receding water table of the Great Basin. As you can see it carved deeply into the surrounding hills. All level water wave marks where wave action has cut these. We're winding our way down off the desert plateau in the valley below where French Glen stands now. The old hotel at French Glen still stands. It was the something happened to the original hotel built by Pete French and his partner Glen, but it, this one was built in the 1920s and it's still in operation. You can go there and get you a meal for a rather steep price, or you can spend a night in this old historical landmark for somewhere around $50 now, I think is what it is. Probably well worth it for the history buffs. From there, we head down a dirt road into Malheur Refuge, and we're going to spend the night at Page Springs Campground. Then the next morning, we're going to get up early and head for Crumble Reservoir. We're at Crumble Reservoir at the first light of day, and Marge is untangling her fishing line 
and getting ready to cast out. Unbeknownst to us, this lake isn't very good fishing anymore. They used to stock it in the fall. Then this shallow desert lake, the fish just grew like wildflower. And by the next spring, they, had, they were about 16 inches long and shaped like footballs. So they weighed more than a pound. But they have quit stocking it. They said the stocking was interfering with the indigenous species, which was the red band rainbow. So I think you could fish here all day and probably never get a bite. So we'll watch a few birds and a few geese. And after we learn that, we're not going to waste much more time. We're going to head out and go up and check the water at Chickahominy Reservoir. We head out and Sam will be following us as we head north toward Chickahominy Reservoir. Sam's antique trailer proved to be really nice in the nasty weather that we had a day or two of. Page Springs is a nice campground this time of year, but earlier it's in the year it's Mosquito City. A few bird nests are in the trees around the campground and later on the swallows will nest on the cliffs. This magpies found him a good bush to build his nest in and he's going to call it home till he raises his young right here in Page Springs campground. The magpies kind of the symbol of the West with all his chattering from the tops of trees. Yeah, I see that. Mm -hmm. Hello. Well, I talked to Julie, and when I was trying to call Julie, she said she was talking to you. Anyway, <clears throat> we gave up on fishing this morning. See, they didn't restock the reservoir. And so... I don't know who chattered the most. Marge on her cell phone... Or those magpies, they didn't even need a cell phone to chatter. We reached Chickahominy Reservoir just before sunset, and we're going to go down and test the water and see if we can catch something. Some little water birds are moving around on the edge of the lake, pecking at anything they can find to eat. A little raft of coots come in around where we're fishing and they're feeding on veg vegetable matters here on the edge of Chickahominy and a little horn grebe paddles his way past us as we're still attempting to catch a fish and well it looks like I didn't do too bad I got one about 19 and a half inches and the other about 16 inches so at least we'll have something to eat. A darn tick is crawling across my leg. I'll have to get rid of him. Seems like several people have complained about ticks here at Chickahominy. I guess it's been a really bad year for them this year. The fishing was really quite good here for some people. Some of them caught 26 inch rainbow trout here which are quite large but we didn't do that well ourselves we got enough for a couple messes of fish at home though and so we're going to head on